Okay, we're uh, going to start here and uh, sure glad to see everybody here today and hopefully more will sign in as we go. And uh, just uh, really uh, happy to have you here. Um, continuing on with Elisha. And uh, so let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you today with thanksgiving and worship. And we thank you for the opportunity to assemble together and fellowship and hear the teaching of your word. Pray that you would be with uh, Jacob and uh, give him your words to say. And we just pray that you would be with us all and help us to grow in you and to put what we've learned into action. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Be with us now, Lord God, as we come up in your word. Yes. Okay. Well, all right, dear friends. Um, if you can join us on Saturday evening with uh, the word for the weekend, we'll be looking at the subject of the rapture, what the apostles taught or what the apostles believed. We want to look at the rapture from the perspective of what the apostles taught the early Christians. And we'll be looking at early Christian history as well as the New Testament. But what the apostles taught about the rapture. Uh, we'll be doing that this Saturday on Word for the Weekend on RTN. It will also be live streamed here on Moriel TV. Um, tonight, though, we're continuing with the saga of Elijah. The saga of Elijah. I'm sorry, Elisha, the saga of Elisha. There's a lot more that can be said about Elisha and how far do you want to go with it. The problem is it's a very fragmented history. It's hard to do it comprehensively or chronologically or sequentially because you have, it's interjected with the stories of um, Queen Athliah, with, 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 with the wars with the Aramites, with uh, the whole epic of King Jehu and so forth. It's not uniform. It's not set out in a chronological order, per se. It begins, it stops, it begins, it stops. So we've been looking at it as a saga from different aspects. Next week, we want to begin uh, looking at a different subject. Next week, we'll begin looking verse by verse at the epistle to the Philippians. We'll begin studying Philippians next week, Lord willing. But for tonight, we're going to continue with the saga of Elisha. Turn with me, please, to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. Verse 14, when Elisha became sick with illness, uh, or he was sick with his sickness, this would suggest he had some kind of a chronic malady, that he had some kind of a chronic malady. The Hebrew is more that he was sick with his sickness. It was something from which he had suffered for some time, okay? Now, this in itself will dispel the myth that people of faith don't get sick. <laughs> Sometimes they do. Sometimes the Lord heals them. Sometimes it's a cross they have to carry for the time being. But in Elisha's case, he became ill with an illness that he already had, of which he was to die. It was terminal. Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Again, reverting back to the imagery of the rapture of Elijah in the chariot of which Elisha was present. And Elisha said to him, take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. And he put his hand on it. Then Elisha laid his hand on the king's hands and he opened the window towards the east and he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot and he said, the Lord's arrow of victory and the arrow of victory over Aram. 
For you yourself shall defeat the Arameans at Aphek until you have destroyed them, until you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. And he struck it three times and stopped. So the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Aram until you would have destroyed it. But now you shall strike Aram only three times. And Elisha died and they buried him. Now the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year. And they were, after the, in other words, after the rainy season and stopped. And they were burying a man, behold, they saw as they were burying a man, a marauding band. And they cast the man into the grave of Elisha. And when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Now Hezael, king of Aram, had oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion and turned to them of his covenant because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence until now. When Hezael, king of Aram, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoahash, um, the son of Jehoahaz, took again from the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hezael, the cities which he had taken in war from the hand of Jehoahaz, his father. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities. The first thing we have to understand is that Hezael, the king of the Aramites, when Elijah, not Elisha, Elijah was still active, he was told to anoint not only Elisha, he was told to anoint Jehu, but he was told to anoint the king of the Aramites. The house of Amri had become so wicked, so wicked under Jezebel, that God was going to use the heathen nation as an instrument of judgment against his own people. And as so often as we see in the patterns of scripture, when God uses a heathen nation, uses unbelievers for his purpose, once he has done that, he raises his hand against the heathen nation. They're simply a temporary instrument of God's correction to his own people. We see that now, of course, as I pointed out many times, with Islam. Islam has been nothing more than an issue of God's correction. It becomes more arrogant, more confident, but God ultimately raises his hand against it and destroys it, even though he may be using it now as an instrument of correction against the Judeo-Christian world, against Israel, against Britain, against the United States and Australia and Canada and the Western countries where terrorist attack and Islamic violence have taken place. But ultimately God raises his hand against his enemies, even though he may use these enemies. Now, no matter what, they remain the enemies. But because in part, Elijah anointed Hezael, God was very slow in doing anything about him or against him. Finally, of course, his son comes to power and then everything is different with Ben-Hadad. Well, we see what takes place. First of all, Elisha's illness. Whether or not we have these intermittent periods where the scriptures are talking about Jehu and talking about Joash and talking about the notorious Queen Athliah and other such figures, whether or not that's the reason that we see, oh, can I get, am I in focus? I can't tell if I'm in focus. Yes, you're fine. Okay. The reason we see this happening may be that 
God only, maybe that God only activated Elisha at certain times for certain purposes. But now there's the final showdown, his final ministry before he goes to be with the Lord, before he goes to be with Elijah, before he goes on to his reward or his temporary reward. Before that happens, he has one final bit of ministry. And it happens. He prophesies and he tells Joash, Joash, do what I'm telling you. Take a bow and arrows. He takes a bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. He put his hand on the bow. Then Elisha laid his hand on the king's hands. And he said, open the window towards the east where the Arameans were. He opened it and said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, even the arrow of victory over Aram. For you shall defeat the Arameans at effect and you sh until you have destroyed them. Look with me, please, to understand what is happening here. What is happening here? Turn with me, please, if you will, first of all, to Psalm 1834. Psalm 1834. He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze, not of wood, but of bronze, much more difficult to fire, but a much more powerful ar arrow with a longer and a more deadly range. Look with me, please, to Psalm 144, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and who trains my fingers for battle. And while we're here, let's just look at verse 8 of that same chapter. Whose mouth speak deceit, whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Anyway, we see in the Psalms that it is the Lord who trains the hand of David or of his servants for war. The Lord trains our hands for war, okay? God is not a pacifist. Now that does not mean he condones violence in every situation, he doesn't. But it does mean he is not a God who avoids confrontation. Let's understand what these arrows represent. Look with me, please, first of all, to Psalm 713. He also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. The word of God employed in what we might broadly call spirit. Illustration to fiery arrows. They're not only there to pierce, but to cause fire. Now, the term spiritual warfare is a loaded term often misused. When we resist sin, when we resist, we resist temptation, that is spiritual warfare. When we engage in evangelism, that is spiritual warfare. When we engage in apologetics against false belief systems, 
That is spiritual warfare. And obviously, when we engage in ekbalo, when we're in direct opposition to the demonic, that is spiritual warfare. Unfortunately, some people have just taken the confrontation with the demonic, like casting out a demon or something, and they think that's what spiritual warfare is. It most certainly is not. It includes that, but it's more than that. We see this, for instance, in the example of Paul and Athens. Be that as it may, the Lord trains our hands for war. Be very careful of people who have the following disposition. One, notice the older prophet trained the younger king. An older generation of leader must train the next generation for war. We are in a spiritual war and we shall be until the Lord returns. Ultimately, the victory is with him and in his return, but we're in a war. When somebody gets saved, they've enlisted in an army from which there is no discharge. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8. There's no discharge in time of war. When somebody becomes a follower of Jesus through second birth, they've enlisted in an army to fight to the death, to fight to the death. Eternal life is assured. Ultimate victory is assured. But it is a very, very strenuous and often painful fight. It seems like it's never going to end. If one generation of leaders in the church, for instance, does not train the next generation to fight, they have failed. They have failed the next generation. Secondly, be careful of those who have this kind of spiritual pacifism. We don't confront error. We just teach the truth and we just allow the Lord to deal with the error. This is ridiculous religious garbage. It is at best the words of an ignoramus. At best the words of an ignoramus. Possibly the words of a religious coward. Paul was wrong. John was wrong. The Hebrew prophets were wrong. When the people of God, when the children of God were being subverted, were being attacked from within as well as from without, they took a stand and fought the cause. You foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Or they named the people who were misleading the church, Philetus, Theotrephes, Alexander the coppersmith, Hymenius, watch out for them. Be careful of people who say, we just have to love. The Lord is going to deal with all the problems. Again, this is at best religious idiocy. It is pseudo-spiritual religious idiocy. It is not God's wisdom. The devil would love all Christians to believe that rubbish because it is rubbish. But it's just not true. He trains our hands for war. You'll see people say, oh, well, I know homosexuality is wrong, but we just have to love them and God will save them. I've seen this in Israel with Philo-Semitic Christians. Oh, these are God's ancient people. We just have to love them. The Lord will save them. No, with no preacher, how shall they hear? Oh, but they might be offended. We just have to be peaceful. And if there's any confrontation or if there's any conflict, we're not being loving. If the Lord didn't love us, he wouldn't care what we believed. Where did Jesus ever preach that way? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Where did he ever preach that way? Where did the apostles ever preach that way? They didn't. Oh, they loved. Therefore, they went to war. 
When we resist sin, we're fighting the old nature. The new nature is fighting the old one. Making excuses for sin. Oh, well, I know, I know the scripture says thou shalt not covet, but I just go, I just feel like I, I, I can go to the betting shop once in a while. It won't matter too much. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Oh, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But they have a different definition of peace. They have the Greek definition, erin, an absence of conflict. They don't have the Hebrew definition, shalom, meaning fullness, where we have the fullness of God's grace, where we have our sin paid for, le shalem, the same as peace, shalem, shalom, le shalem, because the Messiah paid the price for our sin, or to fill, to fill us with his spirit. We have the fullness of the Holy Spirit because the Messiah came to le shalem, le shalem, okay? We have peace because the Messiah came to fulfill the Torah, le shalem, to fill us with his spirit, le shalem, to pay the price for our sin, le shalem. Oh, he's the prince of shalom. He's not the prince of Erin. He's a warrior. When he returns, he returns on a white horse as a warrior in Revelation 19. Be careful of these people who give a different definition to peace than the scripture does and who mistake being nice all the time with being loving. When a parent sees a child or a toddler doing something dangerous, they are very loving because they're protective, but they're not necessarily nice. I told you no. You can be very nice and not love. In other words, you can be religious, but you can't be Christian. Make no mistake about it. The Lord trains our hands for war. And if the older generation does not teach the next generation how to fight, the older generation has failed. Elisha did not fail. Now we are again reminded of his name, Elisha. My God is salvation. My God is salvation. Notice what he did. Open the window, pick up the bow, grab an arrow, and he puts his hands on it. He's almost like a kind of animator of what Joe Ash is doing. He's training Joe Ash's hands for war. Obviously the power of God was symbolically or actually working through Elisha, showing Joe Ash how to fight, what to do. And that arrow was the hour, the arrow of the victory of the Lord. Now the enemy has arrows. Fiery darts of the enemy, he has his arrows. We need the shield of faith to defend ourselves from his arrows. But we shoot back. We shoot back. It was only at his trial that Jesus didn't respond. Before then, he always responded to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. He always responded to them. Well, let's continue looking now. Look with me, please, if you will, um, to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 2.
They were equipped with bows, using both the right hand and the left to sling stones and to shoot arrows from the bow. This is, of course, before King Saul backslid. They were Saul's kinsmen from Benjamin. Notice, they were good fighters. Esther and Mordechai were from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul the Apostle was from the tribe of Benjamin, sons of the right hand. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Benjamin, Benjamin means son of the right hand. They were good fighters. They were ambidextrous in their combative techniques. They were trained for war. They were trained for war. And the Lord has trained me for war. And the Lord has trained you for war. And if you're getting older, perhaps the Lord will come in our lifetime. Perhaps he won't. But the next generation must be trained for war. Look with me, please to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 8. The tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceit with his mouth. One speaks peace to his neighbor. But inwardly, he sets an ambush for him. Arrows are words. The enemy has his arrows. He lies to us. We, in turn, have our arrows. Look with me, please, if you will to Psalm 64, verse 7, once again, the book of Psalms. But God will shoot them with an arrow. Suddenly they will be wounded. Psalm 64, verse 7. Psalm chapter 7, verse 13. Again. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. God has weapons. Double-edged sword. And arrows. When Jesus got into arguments, he would turn the tables on his critics from the religious establishment and finally it said they would not dare question him anymore. He was too good of a shot. Again, this is true in evangelism. It's true in apologetics. It's true in refuting heresy in the church. You have to learn how to use the weapons of the Lord. Now look with me, please, to Psalm 1834. Once more, he trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. First, we see Elisha, my God is salvation, training the arms of Joash so he could bend the bow. 
the arrow of victory, fired out the window towards the east at the Arameans. Okay, but then what happens? Why does he tell him to smite or to literally to strike to beat the earth with them? Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 14. The first thing we must establish is that we are warriors and that arrows are words, good words, deadly words. Sometimes the scripture describes this as quote unquote, cutting to the quick and it brings conviction to somebody. Okay. Now, I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 14. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. Together they will plunder the sons of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. Okay. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and he will wave his hand over the river with his scorching wind, and he will strike it into seven streams. Look with me, please, to Isaiah 45, verse 5. I'm the Lord. There's no other. Other than me, there's no God. I will gird you, though you've not known me. I'm going to make you ready for a war. I'm going to make you ready for a war. Let's go a little bit further. Psalm 45, verse five. Thine arrows are sharp, the people fall under thee. Thine arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. He gets us ready for war, and he shows us how to shoot these arrows, and we see what they are, and we see what they achieve. They go into the heart of the enemies of the king. The Lord, obviously, being our king. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 2. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadows of his hand, he has concealed me. He's made me like a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. You are an arrow in the Lord's quiver. You are someone who brings his word. You are someone who goes up against the enemies of the king. 
you. Now we see this repeatedly in scripture. The Lord strikes them. The Lord strikes the earth. The Lord strikes them. He strikes the earth. He strikes. Why is it talking like this? Let's look at Psalm 11, 2. For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in hearts. When you're in a war, you have an enemy. You are trying to shoot them, and they are trying to shoot you. Now, we know we struggle not against flesh and blood, that the real enemy is Satan. He is armed and dangerous. He is trying to kill us. And he works through people to shoot at the upright in heart. It's a serious business, a very serious business. But the Lord strikes. The Lord strikes. Why is it? talking like this. The next thing we see is that we are an arrow in the quiver. When we are an arrow in the quiver, it means that we are prepared for war, but we never know when the archer is going to take us out of the quiver. As Paul says, be instant in season and out of season. You can meet somebody in an airport or on a bus, and the Lord wants you to share the gospel with them. The Lord can put a believer in your way who has gone into serious doctrinal error. And you know the Lord wants you to tell them. You are an arrow in the quiver. We are at his service 24-7. Instant in season and out of season. He can pull us out of the quiver. Anytime he needs us. But then. Bang. Bang. He only struck three times. Elisha was angry. He said, why didn't you strike more than three times? Five or six times? Here is the problem we have. We delight in a victory, and we should. But winning a battle is not the same as winning a war. Any more than losing a battle is the same as losing a war. War doesn't work that way. Either does spiritual war. Praise God for his victories. But we should never become complacent because of one. There'll be a counterattack. Usually, usually, we should expect a counterattack. That's the way it is. If God is blessing you, God is using you, that's when the counterattacks are going to come. We all see this. We all experience this. Oh, God's blessing you. God's using you. The ministry is going well. The church is growing. Whatever. People are getting saved. Hallelujah. Indeed. I rejoice with you. I celebrate with you. But I know that the enemy doesn't like it. He will counterattack if he can. People only want to go so far. 
they strike the earth with the arrows a few times. We see this continually throughout the books of Kings and Chronicles. There were otherwise good kings of Israel who stopped the idolatry and the Baal worship and the Moloch worship. They stopped those things, but they only went so far. They would not take down the high places. Well, as long as they're worshiping Yahweh on the high place, instead of Baal, it's okay. That's what they thought. No, that's strange fire. When you worship the true God in the wrong way, it will ultimately end in false worship and false belief. Give it enough time, and it won't usually take too much time, normally within a generation or less. I've seen this. You've seen this. I remember people saying, oh, I've met Catholic believers. They were praying in tongues. Yeah, come back two weeks later, they're praying in tongues to Mary. We only want to go so far and not further. Now, this could be in dealing with temptation or the sin that so easily besets in our own life. Well, this will be. In our own life, we all have the sin that so easily besets. As long as we think we have the sin under control. Well, thank God the sin is under control, but it's not going to stay under control. It's not going to stay under control. I know Christians who've gotten, I know Christians who are in bondage to sins that they are totally free from. I know Christians who, although they got saved, they continued to smoke cigarettes. They felt like they just couldn't stop. I've known Christians like that. I'm sure they had a born again experience. But there was this one thing from the old man, the old woman, they just, well, I'll cut back. <laughs> no, you got to cut out. I know Christians who have been set free from a spiritual bond. I believe it was a spiritual, not just, I believe it was a psychological bondage, but I believe there was a spiritual element to it. I know Christians who have been set free from things like internet pornography. I know Christians who the Lord has set free from that. But it wouldn't be enough to <laughs> only watch some of the less defensive stuff or something like that. It doesn't work that way. You have to keep striking. God wants the enemy completely defeated. He wants us completely free of the Aramean or the nicotine or the smut or whatever it happens to be. Now, we all struggle with, again with the sin that so easily besets. Whatever that sin is can vary from person to person, certainly. But there's no variation in the fact that we all have a sin that easily besets. <laughs> you know, we don't want to continue going to war. Now, look, we're not to be pugnacious or argumentative or hypercritical, we're not to be those things. But when confronted with things that God's word says are wrong, we shouldn't try to placate them. Well, you know, he may be dating an unsaved girl, but they're not sleeping together. He shouldn't be dating an unsaved girl. He promised me he wouldn't sleep with her anymore. Oh, she promised me that she wouldn't sleep with her unsaved boyfriend. 
He shouldn't have an unsaved boyfriend. You might get a victory or two. But you're not going to obliterate the enemy. You got to keep going. You must be radical. Those arrows are designed to smite, to strike, not to injure, to kill. Don't worry. The enemy has an arrow with your name on it. And the enemy has an arrow with my name on it. And he shoots to kill. We need to shoot to kill. There must be a radical, radical response to the enemy. There must be a radical, radical engagement in the war. Strike, not once or twice or three times. Strike, 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 strike. You don't want to defeat the enemy, you want to destroy them. If Britain made peace with Hitler, would they have stopped Hitler? No, he would have come back at the first opportunity. He was demon-possessed. So where the enemy is? So let's go through these things. In your life and in mine, if the older generation is not training the next generation for war. We have failed them. And we have failed the Lord. Be careful of spiritual pacifism. Oh, we don't want to argue. We don't want to debate. That's contention. We'll just let anything go, whether it's scriptural or not. Now, I don't mean dividing over secondary doctrines. But when you see people denying flat truth, and in the climate we have now, Christians compromising on same-sex marriage, good Lord. We had that madman this just this past week saying that Moriel is a because it's homophobic, it's a cult, and that I'm a homophobe. This, this, you know, the creep. Uh, Christians are giving into this stuff. They're comp. They're 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 caving in. They're trying to seek accommodation with things that need to be destroyed. There's no accommodation with these things. Not to single out the homosexual issue. That's just the one I got attacked on this week. But uh, we did the teaching on not even a minion. First, they want the tolerance. Then they want your children. They want the right to teach it in schools to your children and grandchildren. Now they're actually singing. We're coming after your kids. You can't make peace with this. It's a satanic power. Oh, God loves gay people. We have to be inclusive. No, God loves homosexuals. Therefore, we must be exclusive. We don't want you people to be left out. Because if you're left out, you're left to uttermost darkness. We will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We want you in, not out. God's club is exclusive. It's not inclusive. Oh, it's inclusive in that the gospel is open to everybody. It's inclusive in that all are welcome. 
but many are called, few are chosen. Be careful of these people who are Christians and they equate Christian Christianity with being nice. If you love Jesus, I can be nice to you. <laughs> but there's a false prophet or a false teacher in the church and they won't stop it. You can't be nice to people like that. Paul told Timothy they have to be silenced. They're damaging the body of Christ. Let the Lord teach you how to fight. He trains our hands for war. Let the Lord teach you how to fight. Arrows are his word, but we are the instruments, the engines of his word. We are arrows in his quiver. It's different than the UK, but in New York, where I come from, a policeman has two weapons. He has his on-duty weapon, and he has his off-duty service revolver. He must carry a badge, a police ID, and a loaded gun with him on his day off or on her day off. They could be going to a ball game. They could be taking their kids to the circus. But they've always got their police ID and they're always packing. Criminals don't take a day off. Either the demons. And either do we. We are arrows in his quiver. Do not be content with a victory. Do not be content when things begin to improve. Be thankful things begin to improve. But don't be content. The Lord strikes. It says he strikes the earth. He wants us to take those arrows and strike the earth. Not no, no, no. It's no more you. Boom, boom, boom. Radical. Finally, we see Elisha gives up the ghost and his corpse is interred in a grave. Now, it may have been by this time, there's only a reference to the bones. The soft tissue would be left to decay, but the hard tissue, the bone tissue, would be removed from the sarcophagus and placed into an ostuary, a bone container. It's always the bones that are left. It's the hard tissue. They've excavated bone tissue that's thousands of years old in some places. Remember, Ezekiel only saw the bones. The soft tissue might be gone, but the structure is there. And so we have the bones of Elisha in a tomb. And during the invasions, the incursions that would have come from Gaza after the spring raining stopped, the conditions would not be too muddy for warfare or chariots or whatever. Well, the land would get overrun. And there would be fights. The enemy is always going to fight. The demons are always going to try to get in. Always going to happen until the Lord comes. In the meantime, it's the way it is. There's no discharge from war. But in a war, some people get killed. 
comrades fall in a strategic war that happens. I live very close to a British military cemetery called Brookwood. It's the largest military cemetery in Europe. You can walk through that graveyard. You wouldn't believe just from the First World War, whole families wiped out. Terrible. There, there were more soldiers killed in this First World War than in the second. It was the blitz and the civilian casualties that made World War II worse than the First World War. It's unbelievable that Brooklyn's, how big it is. It just goes on and on and on. Oh, good Lord. <clears throat> well, that happens in a war. Yep, it sure does. Comrades fall. But when his corpse comes in contact, with the remains of Elisha, my God is salvation, he comes back to life. My God is salvation. Your God is salvation. In his death, we have our life. Even if we snuff it, even if we are martyred, yes, the arrows are flying. Some of us will die biologically, but they will not die. The one who died our death gave us his life. In his death is our life. And so we're told in 2 Timothy, chapter one, verse 10, he has abolished death. Now let me explain what that means. The Greek word therefore abolished, if you don't know, some of you may, is Katargeo, Katargeo. We may have mentioned this once before. Katargeo. Katargeo means to render inoperative. To render inoperative. Christians cannot die, they can only go to sleep. It's going to wake up again. In his own death and resurrection, the Lord Jesus defeated death. He rendered it inoperative. Your funeral and mine are past events. You've already had your funeral. When you were baptized in water, that was your funeral. When I was baptized, that was my, it's over. We're dead already. Now we're new creations. In Christ, there's no death, only life. Death is for the enemy and for the lost. There's no death in Christ, there's only life. Our old nature was buried with him in that crypt. He came out alive. And because of our contact with him, we come out alive. Our God is salvation. The ultimate frustration of the enemy. In a war, the enemy wants to kill you, except he can't even do that. Jesus told the church in Smyrna, fear not the things you're about to suffer. 
Now it's easy for me to say, but I can tell you of Christians that I've met in certain communist countries and in other countries, certainly in Islamic countries, this is their reality. They're fearless. I have met people who are persecuted for the name and sake of Christ who are fearless. I've met them. They're fearless. They're not religious masochists. They don't like being persecuted. But they're certainly not afraid to die. Because there is no death. You sleep. No death. Christians don't think about their funeral. It already happened. Christians don't think about their death. It already happened. All we have to think about is our life. Eternal life. In the meantime, there's a war. Our hands must be trained for battle. The older generation of believers must train the younger generation. We need to be instant in season and out of season. We are arrows in his quiver. We delight in his victories, but we do not become content until the ultimate arrow of the Lord destroys the enemy. What do we have to be afraid of? Death? Martyrdom? <laughs> we should be more afraid of life in this temporal world than we should leave in it. How can you be afraid of something that doesn't exist? It exists for the unsaved. It exists for the world. But it doesn't exist for us. It's like little kids being afraid of the boogeyman. It's a fantasy. Why should you be afraid of something that doesn't even exist? He rendered it inoperative. It is Catonic Gale. That is how Elisha concluded his temporal life in this world. We'll meet him someday. He'll be back here in the millennial reign of Christ. We will know him personally. Won't that be a thrill? But in the meantime, before he went to sleep, that was life in this world. Notice his death gave life to others. Just like Jesus. No, Elisha understood. The older generation trains the next one. The Lord trains our hands for war. There is no spiritual pacifism. We are arrows in his quiver and we must be radical. And not least of all, do not fear a defeated enemy, for the last enemy that shall be abolished is death. That was the saga of Elisha. In Jesus, it ought to be mine, and it ought to be yours. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Hope you can be with us next week when we begin to look at Philippians. And uh, of course, this uh, Saturday, we'll be looking at uh, the rapture, what the apostles believed. Um, thank you so much for joining us once more, once again. I know there's a lot more to Elisha, but it's, it's very difficult because it's not chronological. So there are things about the floating accent and other things we left out and all of the intermediate stuff with Queen Athlea. That in itself is a whole Bible study. How Elijah, Elisha, and John had the same spirit and how there was a wicked woman with John, Herodias, and a wicked woman with Elijah, Jezebel, and a wicked woman in the days of Elisha, uh, Queen Athlea, you know, much like uh, Pilate's wife told Pilate not to stand up for Jesus. There's always this wicked woman. thing. You could do a whole Bible study on that. But we'll conclude for now with Elisha. Resuming next week, Lord willing, with Philippians. Once more, every blessing. Hope you can join us on Saturday. Sandy.